All right, so this video is going to be covering chapter 18, section two, which deals with shifting the equilibrium of systems. And this all has to do with something called Le Chatelier's principle. Basically, that a system suggested to stress, chemical, physical, whatever, will shift its equilibrium, either chemical or physical once again, in the direction that relieves this stress the easiest. So based on Le Chatelier's principle, we're going to be discussing uh, three major ways you can shift the equilibrium of a chemical reaction. In this case, those three ways are pressure, concentration, and temperature. But right now, we're going to be focusing solely on pressure. So let's take, for example, the Haber process. Now, this is a process used industrially to form uh, ammonia from diatomic nitrogen and hydrogen. Basically, what you do is you add pressure. Now, you might say, what does pressure have to do with how fast these are reacting? Now, pressure is only going to affect, um, basically, it's only going to affect chemical reactions that involve gases, which all three of these reactants and products are. So when you add pressure, it's going to look for a way to relieve that pressure. And in this case, because there's one, two, three, four, molecules or moles of gas over here and only two moles or molecules of gases on the product side of the equation this will naturally an increase in pressure will naturally shift the equation to the right meaning it'll create more ammonia due to the fact that it's trying to decrease the number of molecules in the area it's trying to relieve that increased pressure by decreasing the total number of molecules there are in the given volume. And that traces its way back to, you know, the universal gas law. PV equals NRT. Basically, if you increase the pressure, you want to, in order to relieve that stress, naturally this would have to increase. So to maintain the same temperature, you have to decrease the number of molecules you have available. Now a change in pressure does not affect the equilibrium constant. The only one that does is the temperature. Moving on now to how a change in concentration affects the equilibrium constant. Uh, not the equilibrium constant, rather. This, once again, does not affect the equilibrium constant. The only one that does is the temperature. However, it will shift the equilibrium if you change the concentration of some reactants or product, in this case, A. For example, if we were to increase the concentration of A, right now you can see there's a one-to-one -one concentration of A and B versus C and D. If you were to increase the concentration of A, that would throw off the ratio, essentially, the K value, the equilibrium constant, whatever. It would throw off that ratio. And because now there's excess A, it can react with this molecule of B, essentially getting rid of those two molecules and creating a new molecule of C and D, once again to restore the ratio and that equilibrium constant. So this addition of more A created a stress on the system that resulted in an increase in C and D. That is, an increase in concentration of reactants will result in a shift to the right. Likewise, a decrease in the shift of reactants will result in a shift to the left. If you were to instead change the concentration of products, an increase of products will shift it away to the right, and a decrease in products will shift it oh, to the right. Rather, this up here, an increase in products, will shift it to the left, and a decrease in products will shift it to the right. You can sort of think of all of this as a big balloon, really. So if you were to add if you have, you know, your standard balloon or whatever with its nozzle on the end and you were to increase the concentration of A, so make the balloon bigger, um, it's going to shift to the right. In other words, the air is going to shift outwards. Likewise, if you have your standard balloon and you shrivel it up, in other words, you take a bunch of air out of it, you decrease the concentration over here, you're going to shift to the left. It's going to try to fill this balloon back up again. And it's the same way over here. If you have, you know, your balloon and you inflate it, it's going to push things back to the left. If you deflate it, so in other words, you have the shriveled balloon with sort of a vacuum inside, it's going to shift things to the right. Now it's important to note that pure solids and pure liquids 
uh, don't react or don't change concentration rather so they won't appear in the equilibrium expression for example if you have solid calcium carbonate decomposing into calcium oxide and carbon dioxide because both of these are solids they're not going to be changing their concentration in solution because they won't be in solution they'll precipitate out so you essentially you just get an equilibrium expression of the concentration of carbon dioxide. Likewise, if you were to have the gas over here, you'd have one over whatever that reactant gas was. Moving back to the Haber process again, remember for synthesizing ammonia from diatomic nitrogen and hydrogen, uh, this time we've included energy. So now this is a uh, thermochemical equation. And we're going to talk about how changes in temperature can affect equilibrium. And now it should be noted that a change in temperature vastly will change the equilibrium constant K of the equation. However, first of all, we're going to talk about how reactions one way or the other are either endothermic or exothermic, depending on which reaction you're doing. And adding energy to either side, like increasing you know, concentration or pressure, uh, will naturally shift the equilibrium one way or another. And you can think of energy sort of like we did in concentration as a reactant or product. Basically, you need either you're going to produce energy or you're going to you know, release energy. And so it, it sort of is a reactant or product, really, just in a thermochemical way rather than strictly a chemical way. So in the case of the Haber process, adding energy will shift so if you add energy, it will shift towards the endothermic reaction. In other words, if you pump energy in here, you're going to uh, create more nitrogen and hydrogen. You're going to break up these bonds in the ammonia to form nitrogen and hydrogen. Likewise, if you take energy away, so you decrease the concentration of energy, you can sort of think of it, you're leaving a sort of deficit over here that has to be filled. So the nitrogen and hydrogen will naturally form the ammonia. Now you may be saying, yes, uh, change in temperature does affect reaction rate. However, shouldn't it affect all reaction rates the same and therefore you don't have to change the K value? The simple fact of the matter is that uh, change in temperature doesn't affect all reaction rates the same way. So at different temperatures you're going to have different K values. So at K1, at T1, K2, at T2, etc. Moving on now, we're going to be discussing reactions that go to completion. In other words, reactions that are non-reversible. Now you may be thinking that most of the reactions we've looked at so far in this book are non-reversible, but the truth is even those that you know release an extreme amount of energy are in turn reversible if you add that energy back in. But there are three main ways in which you can completely react away your reactants uh, without you know having them come back from the products into reactants. Now these all occur for the most part in a solution and there's three main ways in which a reaction can go to completion. Either from these ions in solution you form some sort of gas that you know bubbles up out of the solution and floats away into whatever apparatus you're using. You can form a precipitate so this all will sort of clump together and not dissolve inside the solution or you can form a slightly ionized product in other words what your ions combine to create will be so slightly ionized that it won't react anymore in order to form reactants from this product now the easiest formation of a gas example that I can think of is a uh, carbonic acid which is H2CO3 dissolved in water now this is what makes all your sodas uh, fizzy and gives it that sort of tang to its taste. And you'll notice when you open up a soda or whatever and leave it out for a long time that you end up with all those bubbles. And those bubbles turn out to be gaseous CO2. And if you've ever put a Mentos in Coke, you'll know that all that CO2 can come rushing out as a gas and then you won't form carbonic acid anymore because essentially the CO2 is no longer dissolved in this water. Now the second way is to form a precipitate that will sort of come out of your solution in the, either in the bottom or floating on top depending on its density. For example, if you take silver nitrate 
and dissolve it in solution with sodium chloride common table salt. And removing the spectator ions nitrate and sodium, you get the following ion equation. Basically, uh, silver, which is a positive ion, combines with chlorine, which is a negative ion, to form this solid silver chloride, which is not very soluble in water, basically. And because it can't just dissolve back into the solution, it sort of comes down out of solution down here, as I've illustrated beforehand. Lastly, you can form a slightly ionized product, and this is what happens in neutralization reactions. Basically, you have, you know, the hydronium from the acid and the hydroxide from your base, and you add them together, and they form water molecules, basically. And because these water molecules are no longer ionized, and more than likely they're the solvent involved, you take these ions out of equation, and they're no longer going to react back to form their reactants. I mean, they will slightly. We went over the KW and what that means about the concentration of hydronium and hydroxide. But for all intents and purposes, uh, those concentrations are negligible compared to, you know, the concentration of hydronium or hydroxide in a strong acid or base. Now, the last thing we're going to be discussing is the common ion effect which is useful, especially next section, for acids, bases, and buffers and whatnot. But basically it's the idea that if you have this reversible reaction, you know, uh, NaCl turns into its constituent ions in an aqueous solution, and you add something to the solution that has the same ions. In other words, you add hydrogen chloride, which is a strong acid, so it break, breaks up completely into hydronium and chlorine ions that's obviously going to increase the concentration of chlorine ions in solution. And because you have, you know, the increased chlorine ions, you're naturally going to shift this equilibrium to the left. And this shift caused not by something in this equation, but rather the in addition of something with a shared ion, the common ion, that is, uh, is what's known as the common ion effect. Basically, it brings the addition of this common ion uh, to these two solutes brings about the precipitation of a reduced ion. So what that all basically means is that adding this extra chlorine is going to precipitate out solid salt.